Before we get started, if you heard there was some music in the background, but I thought it would be best to start us off with just a little Colorado trivia. So that was 1930s big band Glenn Miller. So the question is, is what town did he go to high school in? Who knows that? Well, I see your staff. I want somebody at a table. George Teal. Nope. What town did Glenn Miller? Oh, he said he said Windsor. All right. No oh, right. Yeah, there's Google. Ah, oh, no googling. No googling. None. Turn off the Wi-Fi. Can I try another one? Yes. Oh. Was it? Was it Lions? No. It was. North it's on the oh, Eastern right. Plains. Bennett. All right, jump up. Fort Morgan. Who Fort said that? Morgan. Yeah, f staff did. Yeah, Fort Morgan. Win nothing. Just a few laughs to start off this evening. Well, thanks for entertaining me uh, starting off uh, this evening. I think it's more important where he went to college. Well, <laughs> John blurted that out earlier, so I couldn't go with that question. Yeah. But where he went to college, would you want to answer that? Oh, I think it was uh, CU Boulder. Or something <laughs> You're like that. correct. You're yeah. correct. So good evening. I'm going to go ahead and call to order the uh, Wednesday, uh, Dr. Cog, excuse me, Dr. Cog Wednesday, May 16th uh, board meeting. Um, before we begin tonight, as some of you may know, uh, Mayor Hogan of the city of Aurora uh, passed away on May 13th. Um, it's a great loss for our region uh, and for the state. And I'd like to call upon Director Roth uh, to share some words from Aurora. So I'm not going to try to use my own words. I'm going to use Steve's words. But I will preface it by saying that the words that he gives here are exactly the person that he was. Dear friends, to tell you the truth, I've never been much of a believer in term limits. I wanted you to know that my time as mayor of Aurora will end sooner than I had desired. I have entered into home hospice care with the understanding that my future days will be lived with dignity, grace, and in peace. Please know that my cause of life is public service. It has been my distinct honor to serve as Colorado State Representative and Aurora City Council Member and Mayor of the City of Aurora. Having served 34 years in elected office, the time has passed far too quickly. I am most proud that each day I gave my best efforts and my heart for the betterment of this great city, region, and state. I would respectfully encourage each person reading this message to embrace the honor of public service and to continually seek to enrich the lives of our fellow residents. It is in this honor and in this service where leadership and inclusive government will flourish. Aurora is my heart. I'm so proud of this city, my city. We have grown together and we have grieved together. As a city, we are persistent and we shall continue to prosper together. The people of Aurora define this city. A heartfelt thanks to the residents of Aurora, my former and current colleagues, and all the city employees. What an honor it has been to serve with each of you. Thank you for allowing me to live my best life. Thank you, Director Roth. And now if you all would join me in a moment of silent reflection. And thank you now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Connie, roll call, please. Do you want to do roll call or do you want to do introductions afterwards? Uh, roll call first. Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Elise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Sean Wood? Anthony Graves? Kevin Flynn? Joel Clark? Here. Roger Partridge? Here. Ron Angles? Libby Zabo? Here. Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, here. 
Margot Ramsden, Lynn Baca, Here. Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Here. Tammy Maurer, Carrie, Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Earl Holland, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Here. Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Bryson. Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Here. Jim Dale, Here. Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Christine Berg, Dana Gutwein, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Here. Jacob Lofgren, Wynn Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Barney Dreistadt, Paul Sutton, Here. Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, Julie Mullica, Here. John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Here. Rita Dozal, Here. Jessica Sandgren, Herb Atchison, Shanna Bird, Bud Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter, and we have a quorum. Thank you, Connie. I'd like to welcome a few new members and alternates. We have Paul Sutton, new member from Morrison. Hey, Paul. We have uh, Barney, is it Dristad? Drystad, excuse me, a new alternate from Lyons. And then Kim Groom, alternate for the city and county of Broomfield, I think is in the audience. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for everyone being here tonight. Also, before we move uh, to approve the agenda, I'd like to uh, move item number 12, a presentation on RTD's annual fast track status report. Uh, we have the general manager and CEO, Dave Genova, here to present. Uh, do we need a motion to approve the change in the agenda? And then I would ask for to move to approve the agenda with a change. Do we have a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Director Jones. Sorry, you can finish the vote. Okay. Any no's? <laughs> Substentions? Discussion? Doc, uh, Director Jones. I just wanted to note that Jolyn Clark from oh. Denver, this is his first meeting, so we should welcome as well. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> My apologies. Um, so we'll go ahead and ask for... Uh, David Genova, where are you? There you are. Come on up, and uh, I think you're going to go over this presentation for us. And welcome tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the Dr. Cog Board uh, for the invitation to come in and uh, speak to you tonight and give you a, a brief uh, briefing on the annual uh, Fast Track Status uh, Report. So RTD has expended or committed about $5.6 billion towards the Fast Tracks program, $1 billion of that total. Uh, has either been paid or committed to disadvantaged small minority or women owned businesses. So that's a, a, I think a really great milestone that we're very excited uh, to achieve. And as many of you know, we've completed seven of the Fast Tracks projects. So the W line in 2013, uh, a variety of components at Denver Union Station including light rail, bus and commuter rail uh, between 2011 and 2016, the free metro ride in 2014, uh, the U.S. Flatiron Flyer Bus Rapid Transit Line in 2016, followed by the University of Colorado A Line in April of 16, uh, the B Line, which is the first phase of the Northwest Rail in July of 2016, and then the R Line in February of 2017. So a, a busy 14-month stretch there as we opened four projects uh, within that time frame. Uh, we have one project, and that is the G Line that is undergoing final testing, and I'm going to give you some more detail on that, uh, as well as University of Colorado A Line uh, in a moment on exactly where we are with the grade crossing uh, process. So we have two uh, projects that are in construction that are ongoing. One is the N Line, a commuter rail line, and we're anticipating that we're going to be in construction on that line uh, through most of 2019, and then the contractor will turn that line over to us for testing and, and commissioning. 
and the southeast rail extension, which is a light rail extension of the E, F, and R lines. And we're anticipating that project's moving along well. Uh, we're anticipating revenue service for that line in about mid-2019. So if you would allow me to get into a little detail on what's happening with the grade crossings on the Evers, Colorado A line and the G line, and then, of course, the status of the G line. I know everyone's eager to hear about when we may be able to open, uh, open that line. So in September of 2017, the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, the, or the FRA, which I'll refer to them as, issued RTD a long-term waiver, which essentially uh, accepted RTD's grade crossing design uh, with a buffer time uh, for the grade crossings on the University of Colorado A-Line. Uh, along in that same waiver approval, or that long-term waiver, gave us the ability to remove the grade crossing attendance on the, on the University of Colorado A-Line uh, once we have final approval on those crossings from the Public Utilities Commission. So fast forward to April of this year, April of 2018, we finally received written orders from the Public Utilities Commission, or the PUC, uh, accepting the grade crossing design with a buffer time, the, the very same parameters that the FRA earlier approved in 2017. So that allowed us to initiate with the Public Utilities Commission staff uh, and our team to go out and do the field testing and verification of the grade crossings uh, on the University of Colorado A-Line and then, uh, well, the A-Line. So I'm, I'm pleased to report that we've uh, completed most of that testing on the A-Line crossings. Eight of the crossings are complete and passed, and PUC staff will be filing paperwork on those crossings, and then they will be subject for one final review and approval by the commission. And then the three remaining crossings, uh, we are working uh, with the jurisdictions there to go in and do some adjustments to the traffic controllers, uh, all the other elements passed, and we're anticipating that we'll hopefully finish up that testing on those three crossings uh, next week. So um, uh, we'll have completion information that will have to be filed with the PUC and then on their docket for uh, approval. So we're, uh, we don't know what that time frame is going to look like because of the timing that it will take uh, the staff to file their paperwork, get on the PUC docket, have the commissioners uh, review it. But once uh, we get that approval, we will implement our grade crossing attendant removal plan, uh, which is essentially kind of a public safety outreach plan that the grade crossing attendants will no longer be there with some messaging around safety and, and what all that means. And then we'll be able to remove those attendants uh, from the University of Colorado A-Line. Uh, concurrently, we're working on the quiet zones. I know there's always a lot of questions, uh, particularly on the University of Colorado A-Line, about what's the status uh, of the quiet zones. So some time ago, we filed, along with all the municipalities, uh, along that, the University of Colorado A-Line, we filed the notice of intent to establish quiet zones, and that was submitted to the, the FRA some time ago. And so that's a part of the process. The FRAs completed their civil inspections of all of those crossings, and that went pretty well. The next step is for us to work with, again, the municipalities and the counties to file the notice of establishment of the quiet zones. But, we, but before we file that, uh, and then there's a time frame that FRA has to review the notice of establishment. It's a 21-day time frame. But before we file that, we are going to be sending FRA a letter this week, uh, and we're going to want to try to uh, notify them that we've installed all the equipment and the devices as we outlined in our notice of intent. Uh, and then get their concurrence. As soon as we get that concurrence, we will file uh, the notice of establishment. There is a possibility. We've had conversations with the FRA uh, that we may have to get an additional waiver for the quiet zones, and uh, we're prepared to move ahead with that process um, if we need to. So that uh, that uh, completes what I wanted to talk about on the University of Colorado A line. So status of the G line. So again, we have approval from the FRA and the PUC to do all of our final testing uh, on the G-Line. And we anticipate that we'll go through the testing and verification process of the grade crossings with the PUC team and our team. Uh, we're hoping to do that next week. And it'll be the same process as the A-Line. And then once we receive final approval from the PUC, we will petition the FRA for permission to enter system performance demonstration. This is a period of time we have in our contract for the contractor to demonstrate their reliability and on-time performance and ability to meet the schedule. And as we get into that, uh, we will also be petitioning. Uh, so we have to get permission from the FRA to enter that, that uh, testing, that demonstration period. And at the same time, we will we'll seek their permission to add the G-Line uh, to the long-term waiver. And then we will 
also be proceeding with the quiet zone process as I described uh, on the A-line. So that's the status of the completed projects, the University of Colorado A-line and the G-line. And I know the question is, when are you going to open the G-line? I wish I could give you a date uh, or even a time frame. I think once we get into that grade crossing testing next week and we get a little further down the road with some of the regulatory remaining regulatory approvals we need from the Public Utilities Commission and the FRA, we'll have a little better handle on what that looks like. I've got the team working. Uh, very hard on putting together what we think is a good timeline uh, given all the next steps we've got to do and all the variables uh, that we have left. So uh, what's the, so the, the remainder is just the status on uh, our four remaining uh, projects on fast tracks and some of you may be very familiar with these. So we have four left to complete on the fast tracks program. The remainder of the B line or the Northwest Rail, the remaining six miles of the N line or the North Metro line, the Southwest Rail Extension, which is a light rail extension down to Highlands Ranch, and the Central Rail Extension, which is in uh, downtown. The total capital cost of the remaining programs, about $2.2 billion. That's the capital cost. So that doesn't include any of the operations and maintenance funding. And we've not identified the capital funding yet or the operations and maintenance uh, funding for those projects. Uh, another thing I also want to let the board know is that, you know, we've, we've not really ever put together a complete history of fast tracks from the beginning to where we are uh, today. And we're currently working on that document now, an executive summary, and then a comprehensive report, you know, that'll document the entire program from when it was approved to what's happened along the way uh, to where we are today. And so that, uh, that, com that completes what I wanted to brief you on, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Oh, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Karina from uh, Littleton. So Southwest, of course, um, is of interest. So there has been talk of how do we begin to bring the forces together because it is a region. Um, thoughts, um, direction that you'd like to give us? Well, I, the, the biggest challenge, of course, we have is, is putting together the funding to complete the project. And the, the Southwest Rail Extension, our, our current estimate is about $180 million to finish that project. Um, we sometime went, of course, you know, some of the avenues we would, we would look at is what are the opportunities for federal funding? Uh, what, uh, you know, what does RTD have that we could bring forward? What is available maybe that local stakeholders can bring forward? We had a, a very successful model on the Southeast Extension where we were able to get a federal grant for a pretty significant portion. RTD brought in a portion and then uh, the, some of the stakeholders along the southeast uh, corridor brought in about $25 million in cash and other in-kind contributions. So it was really a way to kind of package it. Uh, what we're hearing uh, federally, as many of you know, is that in the, in the federal funding environment now in, in this administration they're looking for uh, a lower federal share and a much higher uh, local participation. So. Um, I mean, we can have the, the conversations about strategies and things, but that's, I think, where, where we would stand on it. But we're, we're happy to, to have those talks. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank we you all very much. appreciate your evening. Appreciate everything you've done for us. Still like the G-Line to be open, though. <laughs> yeah. It's just horrible that Arvada's chairing tonight. <clears throat> Um, let's get back. Uh, so next up, report of the chair. I don't have anything, so we'll go over to report of the RTC. Well, I might. It, You're off. Yeah, I'd, I'll just mention that uh, the RTC meeting was canceled yesterday, um, and actually, it relates to the action items today, which I'll leave for my executive director report. But stay tuned. Thank you, Mr. Rex. A report from Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we do not have a meeting uh, this month, but I would like to. Um, uh, bring the board's attention to the executive director evaluation uh, that was sent out May 10th. Currently, we only have 12 of 54 that have been completed. I would strongly encourage you to, to do that. Uh, we need to uh, evaluate Mr. Rex. So um, if, um, I guess, Friday I get a list of people and I start calling people, just reminding them. So um, I would like that list to be small. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Director Dyack. Um, next up, report of the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so we approved a, a resolution authorizing the executive director to renew our annual contract with the Colorado Department 
of Human Services to allocate $16.5 million in funds um, to a number of different agencies that do really good things for seniors around our region. And I'll just name a few of them, and it's a very short list of the many that are getting funding um, from Dr. Cog, but Adams County, City and County of Broomfield, Douglas County, Senior Resource Center, Tri-County Health, and Volunteers of America are just some of the great organizations that are getting funding from that $16.5 million allocation. So that's really great, and that will help the seniors in our region. And also we learned um, from Director Sanchez Warren that Next 50 initiative is going to support our no copay radio. So they're going to give us a grant that passes through to pay for that. So that's really exciting. And if you don't know about the no copay radio, you can find out more information on the Dr. Cobb Dr. Cog website, and you can listen to the previously recorded sessions. So you could check that out. Thank you. Thank you, Director Solzman. Um, report from the Executive Director, uh, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a number of items this evening. The first is I want a big shout out to everybody uh, as, as it relates to the, um, the award celebration. Um, it was fabulous. We had 430 plus stakeholders and board members and alternates and the like there. Uh, I thought it was ex went extremely well. Of course, I'm a little biased, but I, I, uh, I really do think it was a great venue. Um, but of course, like always, you know, we, there's room for improvement. So if you have any suggestions, of how to improve that, that, that event, um, please get a hold of myself for Steve Erickson. Uh oh, Bob's already got his hand up. Me Director Roth. I don't have a question. I just want to point out that if we do have pictures next year, like we do this year, did this year, I'm sure they'll be in black and white. Director Atchison is a little older. Oh. <laughs> Wow, very good. No, so thank you all very much for your participation in that. And a big, big, big shout out to our communications and marketing staff. And you guys know, anybody who's done these types of events know how much effort and, and involvement it goes into doing it. And our, our, our staff is second to none when it comes to this stuff. So thank you all very much in communications and marketing. Um, so a few events we have upcoming, the Small Communities Hot Topics Forum. I mentioned this a couple, uh, couple uh, different meetings now. Um, this is the third iteration of, uh, of this series. Um, the topic is, uh, is basically is about economics, and we will have speakers, including our own chief, chief economist, uh, Dan Jarrett, and, and Sam Chapman from the Federal Reserve. We're a little light on registrants right now, so if you wouldn't mind... Um, reaching out to your staffs if you're interested in this topic, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to have more uh, because they have been well attended in the past and we want to make sure those that are interested are, uh, are signed up for that event. Um, the other one which I also mentioned last month was uh, Dr. Cog um, is uh, in partnership with ULI, Urban Land Institute, is bringing ULI's Urban Plan Training pro Program to Colorado. Um, it, we are, we, uh, Dr. Cog will be hosting the first ever ur urban plan training on July 26th at our, at our new offices, 1001 17th Street at the corner of 17th and Arapaho. Um, so we, we strongly encourage you to, uh, to, to participate in that event. We, we think it's, it's a pretty cool deal. It's, it's an opportunity to learn how local, local officials um, can help shape the, 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 the built environment and the important leadership role that you have in, 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 uh, in doing just that. So please give that uh, some consideration. Mobility Choice Blueprint. Um, we had a presentation last month from uh, some of the consultants associated with the Blueprint. Um, so as part of the Mobility Blueprint, Mobility Choice Blueprint speaker series, Dr. Cog will be hosting a panel discussion of national thought leaders um, around the topic of uh, potential effects of technology on our mobility future. Um, we're hosting it in this room on Tuesday, May 22nd from 4 to 6. Um, so we would definitely uh, like and welcome your, your participation in that. It, uh, we will also be streaming the event on Facebook Live. So if you're so inclined, I have no idea what that even means, but I'm sure it's cool. <laughs> Uh, active Transportation Survey. Um, as many of you know, uh, Dr. Cog and, and stakeholders around the region are working um, on our first ever region-wide Active Transportation Plan. Um, and we're very excited about some of the outcomes uh, that we, we expect from this effort. Um, but we, we have a, uh, there's a 10 minute survey that if you wouldn't mind sharing that with your, with your uh, database, um, just so we can get as, as uh, many participants as possible about um, uh, 
you know, active transportation in this region. So there's a, I think there's a little flyer about that as well. So please fill it out yourself as well. Um, CDOT Transit Development Program. I wanted to mention this real quick. Uh, there was a lot of discussion earlier. It was the first part of the year. CDOT was preparing their 10-year development plan and a possible list of projects if uh, new funding were to become available. Well, they're, they're doing an initiative uh, related to transit now. Uh, there was a meeting a couple weeks ago, Ron, and um, it was well attended. We sent invitations out to our reminders, at least, to your staff, and I know several st staff uh, from our communities attended that. Um, so, uh, so basically, this is being done by CDOS Division of Transit and Rail is initiating this process, and they're, you know, like I said, they're trying to mirror that 10-year development plan on the highway side too. Um, the effort will develop approximately about a 1.5 billion dollar list, uh, which we, uh, uh, which the majority, of course, will be in this region. About 945 million or so will be in this will be in this region, and they're going to have that list. They're hoping to develop that list by July. So stay tuned for future meetings. I think it's an important topic, and we would appreciate your participation in that to make sure that our voice in this region is heard when it comes to transit. Uh, let me see here. Oh, June, June board meeting. Um, if you recall, last month we moved the June board meeting from our regular date, which is June 20th, because there's a conflict with the CML conference, and we moved that to, to June 27th. The other thing to remember is that um, that meeting will be held at our new office building, at 1,117th, at the corner of 17th and Arapaho. So, um, yeah, we have a little little handout there. Uh, the chairman is, is uh, putting that out. That's just we will send you some additional information as we get closer with regards to you know how to you know get to the parking garage in the building and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so I will say we currently are on schedule as we sit here this evening um, to begin our move on June 8th, uh, Friday the 8th. We will be shutting down the office at noon on, July 8, on June 8th um, because we'll be shutting down IT stuff and all that kind of good stuff for the move. And we'll be moving over that weekend. So hope, God willing, that uh, at 8 o'clock on June 11th we'll be in our seats. There's a few little outstanding things that uh, I know the superintendent is very nervous about, but uh, we're still hopeful that we'll be able to meet that date. Yeah, Director Rakowski. And we also mentioned that tonight, we believe, is the last meeting we'll ever have in this room. That's very true. Because the workshop for June is, is canceled, thanks to Connie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. So, I mean, take a chair, take a table or something on your way out. <laughs> No, don't take a chair because we're bringing those to the new place. Take the tables. <laughs> Floor panel, uh, you know, carpet panels or whatever you might want to take. <laughs> Projection screen. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so bike to work day, and I know Steve's going to give a presentation on this a little later. Uh, I, I, we do have some posters in that out on the front table. I hope you saw those when you came in. Some additional ones. We have one at your seat as well. Um, and also, please sign up for a free bike to work day t-shirt. Uh, we... Uh, We'd like to make sure those are on your backs on, uh, on June 27th, which is Bike to Work Day this year. That is also the same day as our board meeting. So I'm expecting to see you in that bright orange camouflage Bike to Work Day shirt at our board meeting. Uh, and I'm, I mentioned a few minutes ago about the action items this evening. Um, we did not have an RTC meeting yesterday. Um, we, we, um, we had some concerns about a quorum. CDOT had an event, so, so we canceled that. So you'll notice the action items are worded a little differently this, this, um, uh, in this meeting. We have uh, two action items. So um, if you recall, in order for, uh, so those two action items are related to our Metropolitan Planning Organization function, right, our MPO function. So as a result, we need um, the same affirmative action by both RTC and the board. It's because RTC hasn't met. So the action that you'll see today is approval based on concurrence with RTC, and they will meet at their regular time in, in, uh, in June. So I just want to make you aware of that, especially, particularly the, uh, the, the, the uh, new directors we have in the room. We've done this before, but I just wanted to point that out because it is a little different. Um, oh, also in the board packet this evening, you'll notice on item number 17 in the informational uh, items section, we have, uh, we have something related uh, in there related to our balanced scorecard work. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out to you. So just, just for, again, for the, for the new directors in the room, 
Um, beginning in early part of 2014, we began a planning process to become more st strategy based in our in our pro in our approach here in the organization. And. Um, Oh, I was just handed a note. The, uh, Jerry Stiegel, who's our um, organizational development director, he's not here this evening. Um, but if you do have questions about the, this specific measurement, um, you know, Ashley Summers is going to be in the room a little later, so she she can definitely answer it because it was it was basically, um, you know, we take ownership in in some of these objectives, and that is one of hers. I don't want to get into the weeds too much on this, but basically what we hope to do, we're at that point now in, in our, in our uh, we have enough historical data that we be, can begin to flush out some of those obje objectives and, uh, you know, how we measure those objectives to see if we're, we're succeeding in, in uh, attaining that objective or, um, you know, not doing so well. So this is just, this is quite frankly one of the simplest ones that we have within our scorecard. Um, so, you know, the report tonight focuses on uh, promoting informed decisions and the single measurement of uh, website traffic. So just FYI, these will be included in your packet, you know, periodically throughout. Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out to you. Uh, we, you know, just another uh, comment on, on uh, Mayor Hogan. Um, I, most of you probably know this already, but I wanted to make sure everybody was aware that uh, memorial services are scheduled for 11 o'clock on Saturday, May 19th at the Heritage Christian Center, and that's at uh, 14401 East Exposition Avenue in Aurora. Yes, sir. So just real quick, um, the service starts at 11, the doors open at 1015, parking is going to be a challenge. Um, there is an R-Line station, the metro station, that's less than a block away. So this, this, uh, this uh, church is at the corner of Exposition and Sable, and just about a half a block east on Sable is the metro station. So if you want to take the R-Line and get off the metro station, that's another option. Great. Thank you, sir, very much. And my last item this evening, um, each year, Dr. Cog, we... Um, we select an employee of the year. Uh, it's actually done. It's nominated by staff. They do it themselves. They write up a little deal about it, and then they, the, um, the uh, uh, senior staff, the division directors, then, then make a determination. We vote on those and then arrive at a uh, selection. And uh, this year, we will be honoring Amber Liebman. Lieberman, is she here? Yes. Yeah. Amber's in the back quarter. So, you know, I, over the last 18 months, before I hired Ron, um, I spent an awful lot of time in this place. But I, there's probably one person that spent as, as, probably as much time as me, and that's Amber. She's, she's unbelievable. She's, uh, she's the communications and mar uh, manager on Steve's team in communications and marketing. Um, she oversees a staff of five copywriters, graphic designers, and web and news specialists. And uh, I'll be honest, you know, she's, she's unbelievable. Our whole communications team is unbelievable. What they do back there really makes uh, Dr. Cox shine. So, uh, Amber, thank you for all your work over the last year and the last few years that you've been here. It's one of the best hires. I always tell Steve it's the best hire he's ever made. <laughs> <laughs> no, so thank you very much. And, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Rex. Now we're up for public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are any additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the time of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that, that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public meet hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have anyone who would uh, wish to speak? Seeing none, we'll move right along into uh, move to approve the consent agenda for April 18th. So moved. I have a first and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Discussions? That's passed. Moving right along to item number nine, discussion of Title VI plan, attachment B. And we have uh, Matthew Helfand. You're on deck. No. He's, he's actually up on plate. Sorry, he's on deck. 
Next one is Emily's on deck. Right. Go. Good evening, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, as a federal funding recipient, Dr. Cog is required to have a Title VI implementation plan. Uh, this plan guides practices that ensure equal access to all federally assisted programs and activities. Staff recently submitted our plan to CDOT, who administers Dr. Cog's federal transportation grants and received concurrence. While this plan is new, it documents a compilation of activities that Dr. Cog already performs. Uh, Dr. Cog staff recommend approval of the Dr. Cog Title VI implementation plan, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, I guess we'll look for uh, an action. Yes, uh, Director Baker. I move to approve the draft Dr. Cog Title VI Implementation Plan contingent, contingent on the Regional Transportation Committee's concurrence. Second. And I have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Abstentions? Discussions? That's passed. Now Emily's at the plate. Discussion on the selection of the transportation uh, demand management pool projects. Emily Lindsay, please. Good evening, everyone. I'm Emily Lindsay with Dr. Cox Transportation and Planning Operations staff. And I'm here to talk to you guys about the transportation demand management set aside of the TIP. Um, so some of you may remember, uh, you saw me last fall to talk about eligibility evaluation criteria and selection process um, for this set aside of transportation demand management projects. Um, Dr. Cog issued a call for projects in November of 2017. Um, we received 15 applications for infrastructure and non-infrastructure projects. Uh, we only received one small infrastructure project application. The rest were non-infrastructure. We received around $2.4 million in requests for non-infrastructure projects, which is around two times the amount we have available for those types of projects. Um, we convened a project review panel, uh, and like all TIP set-asides, these panels are made up of subject matter experts. Uh, we had representative from CDOT, uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the Regional Air Quality Council, um, RTD, Denver South TMA, um, and two representatives from Dr. Cog's staff. This is a similar makeup to what's proposed in the eligibility document and pretty similar to past panel reviews. The panel met four times in 2018 and we're responsible for scoring 65% of the project score. Um, and they rated a bunch of different categories from innovation to project read readiness, synergy and project timing, VMT reduction, funding effectiveness, transit relationship, and they had an other factors category. Um, the remaining percent, 35%, were based on more quantitative measures that were scored at the staff level. Um, these were really uh, data-driven calculations uh, for congestion user base. Um, urban centers and the like. We also coordinated with the Federal Highway Administration um, since we were, oh, sorry, that wasn't me, right? Okay. Um, we were, sorry, uh, using CMAC guidance to guide the project eligibility process and with the increased scrutiny um, kind of on transportation performance measures and criteria for federal funds, uh, they were instrumental in reviewing kind of all of the project elements. We did ask some folks to kind of rescope and we had to rescore based on the eligible activities outlined in that CMAC guidance. Um, the panel recommendation you'll see really focuses on innovation, um, transferability kind of of learning from projects and some of the outputs of those projects. And they were really interested in seeing more small infrastructure projects, which is why you'll see in the memo that they recommended conducting a standalone small infrastructure call for projects um, and doing a little bit more robust outreach to um, work with local governments to see what we can do to get more projects submitted in that category. Um, so as Doug said, the TAC did see this. They recommended going with the recommendation of the project review panel and then RTC will go to in for their June meeting. But I'm happy to take any questions about the projects of the process. Any questions from the board? Yes, uh, Director Elrod. When is the next call for projects then for the, the smaller piece? 
So we haven't outlined that just yet. We're kind of going to go through this process to award the projects that are proposed right now, and then once we have the okay to do that, we'll be able to set up the timeline and measures for that you next call. you expect it'll be this year, though? I don't see why not. Yeah. Okay. We'll be ready. All right. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Anyone wants to take it? Thank you, Director Partridge. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the project's highlighted in attachment one to be funded through the TDM set aside of the Dr. Cog 2018 to 2021 tip contingent upon the Regional Transportation Committee's concurrence. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Any discussion? That's passed. Thank you, thank you very much. As you know, I'm trying to make this meeting a lot faster than our other chair does. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to be as efficient as possible. So moving right along, Rich, let's, uh -oh. yes, I'm not as good as Bob Roth. <laughs> so, so Rich, Thank did you know the answer to my trivia question this morning? I saw you jumping yes, up did. back there, and yeah. I know you wanted to. I knew to. it was Fort Morgan. Yeah, yeah. see? <laughs> I couldn't let the staff, because I knew you were all I know. I waited until, <laughs> All right, Rich, you're up on the okay. legislative wrap-up. Thank you. I, th I think this, this is just an informational briefing, so I'll, I'll be quick, but obviously uh, invite any of the board members to make comment on any of the topics or, or ask questions. Uh, but I wanted to give you a, a brief update on our uh, on the uh, recently completed legislative session and ask Jennifer, one of our lobbyists, to join us, too, in case she can answer a question I can't. <laughs> uh, but Jennifer Castle... Uh, is one of the team of our uh, contract lobbyists. Her partner, Ed Bowditch, is, I don't know, off somewhere in southwestern Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Jen, Jen's here. Uh, real quick, I'll start briefly with uh, budgetary issues. Uh, obviously, there were some important budget issues with transportation, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, it was a good year, I thought a very good year, actually, for uh, aging funding. Uh, starting with uh, uh, approval of our request for uh, an increase in $4 million for state funding for senior services. Actually, most of the real work on that was done before the session even started when we were successful in getting the governor to include that uh, in his budget request, but we did have to do some work during the session to make sure the Joint Budget Committee kept it in the long bill, and we were pleased that they did. Um, the, we were also involved in helping some other or agencies work on getting some funding for some programs that we, that Dr. Cog's staff work on or we collaborate with, and that included uh, some money for the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging uh, that has most of their meetings here in Dr. Cog. I don't know what's going to happen when we move to the new building, uh, but uh, help them get some additional funding to continue uh, their work, uh, so an increase in funding for the state long-term care ombudsman, uh, and then also some funding to continue the uh, com uh, the Colorado Choice Transitions Program, which is a program that Dr. H Cog helps HICPUF with uh, uh, transitioning uh, residents of nursing homes back out into the community. So I think those were all, all good that those got funded. Um, the second page of the uh, in the attachment, uh, the little uh, summary that I wrote goes through some of the other aging related bills that Dr. Cog worked on. Um, the long-term care ombudsman one uh, really was taken care of early in the session, helping to make sure that the Department of Public Health and the Environment has the uh, authority to implement assisted living, new, newly revised assisted living regulations and uh, a, fee, a fee program to help fund additional uh, surveyors. And so that was good. Uh, we did lose one. We were working with uh, Colorado Senior Lobby and some other folks to try to increase or actually index the what's called the PTC rebate to inflation. Uh, that bill passed in the House, but it uh, failed in the Senate. I expect that will be back next year. Um, finally, 
uh, we were uh, able to get introduced uh, late in the session a bill to fix the little, I, I've mentioned it here before, a little technical problem in the mandatory reporting law for uh, abuse of uh, at-risk adults. And we were able to get, actually gave able to get that through the session. If you count the House and the Senate, uh, a total of a 95 to nothing vote. Uh, it would have been the full 100, but I don't know, there were five slackers that weren't, 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 <laughs> weren't, <laughs> were excused when they had the votes on the floor. So uh, I think, it was, so that was, that was, it was a, it was a nice one of those technical bills. Uh, so it wasn't really controversial, but we were glad to get that done before the session ended. Um, I just had a brief little mention of, of uh, housing, affordable housing bills and renter's protection bills because I did talk about those quite a bit at previous board meetings. There were a few bills uh, that did pass, but several others that did not, and I expect to see those back again next year. Uh, and then finally, the transportation funding. I expected uh, uh, Mayor Atchison to be here. <laughs> uh, but he did a, he did a great job uh, testifying for Dr. Cog in, in committee. Uh, and uh, I think between uh, Doug, uh, he and I, we were on the phone and texting quite a bit the last month of the session as the bill really started to heat up in the House. And um, I don't know if I need to go over the, any of the outline of the final part of the bill, which we can, we can do. And, and we can even uh, get something out to you if you guys want something in, in, in writing. But uh, I, was, I, was, I was pleased that uh, particularly as the House, as the bill got over to the House and was getting changed and, and so forth, uh, a number of legislators uh, and even the governor's office uh, reached out to, to Dr. Cog, to us, uh, me and our lobbyists, to, to see what we thought of certain amendments that they were proposing. So that was good that we were able to, to make our, our presence known on, on that bill. Um, and as you know, it finally did pass, and so we'll see what happens going forward with any proposed initiative. Uh, but with that, I'll stop and see if Jennifer wants to add anything or if there's any comments or questions, or Doug, if you got anything to add. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? I do. I just okay. want to say real quick, um, yeah, it was you know pretty fast and hectic there in the last couple of weeks for sure. Uh, Rich, I know his fingers are probably uh, to the bone, but he's texting so much uh, on it. But uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think the, the, the principles that you guys gave us at the last meeting really helped us. Yes, in, they were in, really important. Provided yeah. our guidance. Um, you know, we had some wins. We had some losses, you know, with regards to, to the trans to Senate Bill 1. Um, you know, we were able, I say we, I mean, collectively, you know, the, ultimately there was a, um, you know, we did get some local share within um, the, the, you know, the initial upfront four, $495 million. And then next year's 150 million. Um, it's not a lot of money, but at least you know it, it's a recognition that you know what locals locals have issues too, right? Um, so it so so that was kind of good, you know. On the bonding side of that, um, you know, we were not successful in, in uh, getting anything in there, but you know that was really you know as we talked to one of our principals that we and we've been consistent with this through the years about bonding that um, you know unless there's new revenue, there's always um, there's always some concern about ultimately how that debt service is going to be paid, and so we we were um, you know so we were we were cautious about those discussions when we had it, um, but it I think it does provide a you know a boost in the, on the transportation funding side. We as you know the story is can still be written that this is not you know this doesn't solve our problems right whether it's in the region or the state, um, and the necessity to um, to ultimately come up with a with a longer term funding solution is essential. So we'll be working on that um, as we go forth over, over the next few months. I would like to point out, guys, and I I I don't, I don't mean to get platitudes to staff all the time, but I mean they do do some serious serious good work for this agency and for you all. This man is unbelievable. <laughs> I I mean there was there was times I pass him in his cubicle. He'd be there like at seven in the morning. And I wouldn't see him again. <laughs> I'm like, you okay? And you, I say, you know, he goes up, but I mean, it's unbelievable the, the level of respect, and I think Jan could probably speak to this too, that they have for Rich over at the Capitol. There's some legislators, particularly on the aging side, they won't move unless they talk to Rich first. <laughs> I mean, that is, that's pretty, that's pretty significant. Um, and, you know, I, so I, he does tremendous work for you all, and I think it's, it's worthy of pointing out. Thanks. <laughs>
Do we have any questions from the board? Seeing none, thank, thank you, you, Rich and Doug, for the great work you did this year, and uh, I guess for Herb yeah. for being there for us. So moving right along, I think we're hitting an hour ahead of time, right on. Number 13, present. okay, but no long talkers going on. No long talker. See, Ron's telling me no long talkers. Um, presentation on the bike to work day, Steve Erickson. Here he comes. Hello, Eric. This is why we're slow. You just added, you just added in a minute and a half to our evening. All right, now we're moving on to number 14, update on Twin no, <laughs> Wow. All right, Steve, entertain us. Entertain us? Wow. <laughs> Th Bikes thank you, Mr. Chair and directors of the Dr. Cog Board. I am here to talk to you tonight about my favorite day at Dr. Cog. And I mean every year my favorite day is, is Bike to Work Day. And I was thinking about that um, a little bit and, and, and asking myself, well, why is that? And I think what you probably many of you know about this event is this really exemplifies collaboration in the region. And so it's kind of an extension of the things you guys are doing every single day here. I'm out of breath from running in so fast, but um, if, if you think of the number of partners that are involved in, in Bike to Work Day, it's actually pretty amazing. This award behind me up on the, the top shelf, uh, that's from Colorado uh, Business Roundtable. We got this last year. Um, we were the winner of their gold award for nonprofits for collaborative effort, but literally between our business challenge partners, our station organizers, our jurisdictions, our sponsors. We have well over a thousand people that are involved in Bike to Work Day every year, and that's not mentioning participants and all of, all of you that help us out in various ways. So I'm excited to talk about it, even if I'm a little out of breath. So I'll give you a quick overview of way to go. I think for most of you, this is a bit of a going to be a bit of a, a refresh, but we do have some new people on the board, so I'll just spend a couple of minutes kind of giving you an idea of what the Way to Go program is. Talk a little bit about what's in store for Bike to Work Day this year. Whew, Ashley's here. Um, we're going to build on our past success, but I want to share with you some, some things that are new. Talk a little bit about the, the purpose of the event, and really we're focused on the long-term benefit. I mean, this is sort of a signature event for the region. We're actually nationally known um, for our Bike to Work Day event here, but it's really for us all about the long-term benefit and I want to ask how you can help because I know you're all wondering how can I help Steve with Bike to Work Day, so let's get started. So the Way to Go program, uh, many of you know it's federally funded. Um, uh, we get CMAC, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality, dollars uh, that, that fund the Way to Go program. That program is actually a partnership, so it's Dr. Cog and it's seven transportation management associations in the area. And most of you would be familiar with those uh, TMAs that work in your areas. So uh, Boulder Transportation Connections, Commuting Solutions, Smart Commute Metro North, Northeast Transportation Connections, Downtown Denver Partnership, um, Transportation Solutions, and Denver South are the TMAs that are part of the Way to Go Partnership. Um, we work together collaboratively and this is another thing where we get a lot of national attention. Um, people are calling us to wonder, how do you do this in the Denver region? How do the seven TMAs get together with the MPO and actually work together cooperatively on region-wide uh, region advertising and outreach efforts? So um, you'll see region-wide campaigns, advertising campaigns. We get our biggest bang for the buck in terms of outreach, uh, employer outreach. So we have people on Dr. Cog's staff and then the TMA uh, folks have uh, people on staff that are actually going out and meeting with employers and talking to them about commute options and, and implementing commute options in the, uh, in the workplaces. Uh, we do campaigns. Uh, one of the well-known campaigns we do in the fall is Go-tober. Uh, and a lot of community outreach. You'll see us at health fairs. You'll see us at uh, fun runs and then events. And Bike to Work Day is by far our biggest event. So the big uh, goal for the Way to Go program is to get people out of single occupant vehicles, um, uh, fewer SOVs. So we focus in a number of areas. So I'll go through these quickly, but carpooling, believe it or not, 
Dr. Cobb has been promoting carpooling since the late 1970s when the program was known as Ride Arrangers. Um, started with the uh, Arab oil embargo, I believe, and um, so we've been in that business for a long time. Many of you have probably seen our van pools on the road. I think we have about 120 van pools. These are typically for five or more individuals um, commuting longer distances, typically at least 10, if not 15 miles. Um, again, just another way to get people out of single occupant vehicles. We promote transit, work closely with RTD uh, to promote uh, bus and light rail and commuter rail ridership, uh, walking, active transportation, Teleworking and alternate work schedules. Again, if we have somebody who's working from home, they're not clogging up I-25. And then finally, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but biking. And really biking, we're going to talk about Bike to Work Day, but we're promoting biking year-round. Um, and it's, it's growing. It's actually the fastest growing mode in the region right now. So Bike to Work Day, uh, uh, we're in our 28th year uh, of, of hosting this event. In Colorado, it's always the fourth Wednesday of June, so June 27th this year. That's actually by Colorado statute. So some of you may be aware, you may even see uh, news stories this week. It's actually National Bike Week this week, and a lot of metro areas are doing uh, their Bike to Work Day this Friday, the 18th. Um, our legislature determined, and I think in their wisdom, that the weather was pretty dicey this time of year and maybe the fourth Wednesday of June would be a, a better option for Colorado, particularly if you think of some of our mountain communities. Um, so what we do is we try to provide this really fun, supportive, and safe environment for people to try bike commuting. And what we know is if people try it and realize, hey, this isn't so difficult, our surveys show, we do a lot of follow-up surveys, that they'll continue to bike on a regular basis, not just for um, commuting, but for other reasons as well. So really it's all about um, Bike to Work Day being a catalyst for behavior change. And I know I've mentioned this probably a thousand times. Um, we're the second largest Bike to Work Day uh, event in the nation. Does anybody remember who's number one? I heard San Francisco. It's the Bay Area, nine counties in the Bay Area. The last time they actually reported numbers in the way that we report numbers, um, they were at 40,000. Um, I, I suspect we're going to be at 36 this year, so we're, we're chasing them, but you know, I haven't seen recent numbers from them like for the last two or three years, but we're pretty proud of, of what we do. Going the wrong way. Wanted to show just a quick video. This is something we produced. Um, in support of Bike to Work Day, so let me see if I can get this to work. Are you tired of this? How about this? Maybe this. There's a simple solution. It's a bike. No, not that bike. It's that thing you learned how to ride as a kid. It got you from A to B and came close to making motorcycle noises. That's it, a bike. And guess what? It's back in a big way. And it can get you to work, too. So what are you worried about? Getting lost? It'll take too long? It's dangerous? <gasps> Nonsense. And you know what else they say? Driving costs money. Car payments, insurance, gas. Not to mention your happiness and health. Don't know where to start? It's simple. Way to go created this for people like you. Use the route planner. Find bike paths and bike lanes to help you get there safely. Then practice your ride over the weekend to get comfortable. I know. Awesome. So which makes you happier? This or this? Here's a quick recap. Biking to work saves you money, makes you happy, makes you healthy, and it's good for the environment too. Check out waytogo.org for more information on biking to work. Are you guys ready? Are you not entertained? I was extremely entertained. Thank you. So our goals this year, um, 36,000 riders, 38% uh, first timers. So think of that. We want to introduce 13,000 plus people to bike commuting on one day. Um, we expect to have close to 350 breakfast and bike home stations. The thing that's really grown in the last few years is we're seeing more and more um, 
uh, bike parties in the afternoons and, and, and evenings, and again, just more breakfast stations offering you know more variety of, of snacks and beverages. So it's it's really growing. And again, it, what we know in the Way to Go program is if we can get businesses, um, employers behind these efforts, it really results in in long-term change. So we are targeting, and this is kind of an aggressive number because I think last year we were about seven, at about 700. And 10 or 720, but we want to have 800 organizations participate in the business challenge uh, this year. Again, we know if, if uh, people join Bike to Work in that way, that they're much more likely to continue. So what's new for 2018? I think some of you, well, at, the, at your tables, you have the flyers with uh, the poster design this year. Um, some of you may uh, know that we actually put out a, a call for artists each year. Um, so the poster design is, is new every year, and um, we're getting a lot of really, really positive feedback on the, the poster design. So uh, T-shirts, if you haven't signed up, please do so on your way out. Those are free of charge. We're giving prizes on the thousands. Um, I, I'm already remiss, but I want to introduce really the, the Way to Go program manager. I don't do much work here, um, as Doug pointed out, you know, relative to Amber. But, but Celeste davis Stragan, please stand up, and I'm giving you a round of applause. She's really the one that does most of the work on Bike to Work Day. Um, prizes on the thousands, we have concert tickets and AAA memberships and not area agency on aging AAA. The other one. The other one. Um, Denver Business Journal is sponsoring our business challenge uh, this year, which is really great. Um, they're a wonderful partner helping us get the word out. Uh, uh, incidentally, there was just an article in Denver Business Journal today um, ranking Denver Metro as the fourth most bike-friendly city in the country. Um, they had Minneapolis, I think, ranked first, and I forget yeah, who, you know, who was two and three. But um, So there's a grand prize. This is pretty cool. It's a, a cycling trip to Iceland. Now, I want to clarify, when I, when I reread that, you do not have to ride your bicycle to Iceland. Okay? <laughs> we'll actually fly you to Iceland where you can cycle around Iceland, but that's the grand prize this year. So more stations, more businesses, more fun. Um, a lot of communities are doing Bike to Work Wednesdays. Boulder always goes above and beyond. They do walk and bike month, um, all month long, and have some really cool events up there if you're interested. And I know Doug had touched on Winter Bike to Work Day um, in one of his executive director reports, probably in February or March, but we participated in that for the first time this year, um, competing internationally. And if you combined Denver, Boulder, Aurora, Littleton, Lakewood, those, those where we had significant numbers, we would have actually finished in first place in the entire world for Winter Bike to Work Day. So um, good job. There's the poster. Uh, and again, I just want to reiterate or restate this is really all about long-term behavior change. It ties right into the Metro Vision goals that we have for non-SOV trips. Um, we want to go from about 25% today to 35% by 2040, so um, there's, there's a strong connection between people biking and walking and using these other modes and, and getting to those goals. And I want to just say Dr. Cog you know, leads the way, at least in terms of this effort, but there is a really healthy ecosystem and just a lot of wonderful partners in this region. It's your jurisdictions, it's organizations like Bicycle Colorado and Bike Denver, and um, it's just endless. And again, this is, again, I think one of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about this event is just the amount of community and regional support that we get for it. Uh, just some quick facts. Um, we currently have about 2,300 miles of bicycle facilities in the region. In the last tip cycle, 21.4% of the the funding went to bike and pedestrian projects. Um, your communities are doing a lot of great things. We heard in the TDM set aside, Inglewood is, is, is putting in a new bike lane. Um, I would encourage all of you when we do this next call for projects to really think about that. We were, we were actually really disappointed we didn't have more of those small infrastructure projects um, submitted this, this last go around. I'm thrilled about the active transportation plan. This is the first time we've um, developed a regional active transportation plan. Um, so just a lot of really good regional momentum. Uh, and just to you know, uh, emphasize how much biking is taking off, um, between 2000 and 2014, the number of bike commuters doubled. Colorado is the number three state in the uh, uh, bike commuting in the nation. And to, to tell you how fast it's growing um, compared to other modes, by 2040, our travel model says um, all trips will increase by 35%. Biking trips will increase by 56%, so we are headed the right direction with this one. 
So that's really it, other than how you can help. Um, please order a t-shirt. Think about distributing posters. That one flyer on your table sort of has this uh, encapsulated. But um, on Bike to Work Day, do visit some breakfast stations. Even if you're not biking, go out and say thank you to those people. And it's just such a good spirit on, on Bike to Work Day. Um, make certain your city or town or county is um, uh, involved in the business challenge. If you don't know if they are or not, call me or call Celeste and, and we'll let you know and, and help put some pressure on, on those folks. Make sure other businesses in your uh, jurisdiction are also signed up. Post on social media. We just uh, uh, started a, um, an Instagram account and ride on Bike to Work Day. So that's really it. Just some fun pictures and I'll take any questions. Any questions from the board? Yes, Director Beacom. Just a limited question. What about the electric assist bikes that some people use? Is that a participant that's allowed? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's really growing fast. And even one of the bike share projects, the one up in Adams County, I know they're looking at that. That was one of these TDM set-aside projects, looking at that as part of what they want to offer up there. I would check your ordinances, though. Yes, I, there are. Okay, good. Not everyone changed. We're all trying, but I know we're trying to change it because some ordinances won't allow them. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Erickson, for entertaining us. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have item number 14, update on the 2020 uh, cons uh, census. Ashley Summers, you're up. Hi, thank, thank you. Thank you for coming early. Yes, sorry, I just got in here right in time. <laughs> Thought I could sneak out to yoga and get back without you noticing, but hello. So um, I'm going to talk about the three handouts that you have in your packet um, to go over these programs that, um, that you should be aware of as we approach the decennial census. So we've got the Boundary and Annexation Survey, or BAS, the Local Update of Census Addresses, or LUCA, or, and the Participant Statistical Area Program, or PSAP. So BAS is an annual program. You're able to do this every year to update your boundaries. Um, you should have received an email about this in December, and the deadline is on um, May 31st. So you have a couple weeks left to submit any boundary changes that you need to, um, to make the census aware of. And if you do get those boundary changes in by the end of the month, those will show up in um, census materials for next year. So LUCA, the next program here, is something that's going on right now. This is a program that only takes place in the couple of years right before the decennial census. This is a program to allow you to check the addresses that the census has on file and make sure that they're capturing all the addresses in your jurisdiction. So the opportunity to participate in this program was extended to you um, in 2017, and you should have been mailed materials to look at um, in about February or March of this year. How many of you are participating in LUCA that you know of? Oh, good, great, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so that it's supposed to go to um, the highest elected official, and uh, so uh, that should have percolated out there somehow. Uh, but th not all is lost. It's okay. Great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the good thing is that we did um, an a workshop for this and some seminars at the GIS level, so people who are very familiar with your addressing data. We, we talked about that uh, with all of them last October or so, and then Dr. Cog reached out to um, the GIS professionals th the, at your jurisdictions and uh, offered to be part of this if, if any of your staff needed help. So you were able to, um, by the end of last year, either accept the opportunity to do it yourself, defer to um, an entity like Dr. Cog or DOLA, um, or decline to participate. So Dr. Cog is participating on behalf of six different jurisdictions right now, and DOLA is participating on several others. So um, there is a chance that if you didn't officially sign up to do this, that um, DOLA is still looking at your addresses, or, or we are. Uh, both BAS and LUCA are important programs because it's the primary way that you tell the census uh, where you want them to send a, a census survey. So it's the primary way that you make sure you get a good population count, which is important because, as we all know, uh, federal dollars are um, allocated that way. So uh, 
Luca is uh, will conclude uh, around June, July of this year. Uh, once materials were sent to us, we have um, 120 days to respond. So we'll be responding this summer, and then um, the census will be looking at what we've provided and responding back to us to see if if they agree with any of the edits that we've suggested. So, any questions on that? The third program is upcoming. So PSAP is about the geographies that census data is reported out in. So tracks, blocks, and block groups. They ask us to reevaluate these before each decennial census to make sure that they still make sense. So uh, there's a range of population counts and housing um, counts that should be within each um, tract. Otherwise, if it's too much, then they suggest that we split it into two, or if there's not enough, they want us to merge those tracts. And that way, uh, the analysis over time is uh, a little bit easier to do, and we can also backtrack. We can do trend analysis, and we have more confidence in um, the census numbers. So the PSAP program is something that Dr. Cog will be tasked with we have not received our official invite yet, but we will get that sometime this summer. And then we'll have about six months um, until the end of the year to think about how we're going to engage all of you to see if there's any changes you would like to make in addition to the required changes that we'll be asked to look at. We'll be making those changes in quarter one of 2019 is my understanding, but we'll know more as they, um, as they extend that offer to us to participate. Any questions on any of that? Questions from the board? Seeing none. Thank you, Ashley. Awesome. Thanks. Good job. Next up, committee reports. Uh, report on the uh, stack. Um, Mr. Papstorf, you're going to do that if for uh, Mr. Partridge since he had to leave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Pinch hitting for Director Partridge who had to leave. I believe it is. My light is on. It's just really low. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll make this brief. Um, Mr. Chair and directors, um, there were no action items on the stack um, agenda on um, April 27th. Um, we had a series of updates uh, presented, um, an announcement that CDOT had issued the um, 2000 uh, the next draft STIP uh, out for public comment. Public comment is um, open from April 19th until May 31st. Uh, the, stip, the draft STIP is available on the CDOT website. Um, uh, Director, uh, Executive Director Rex talked about the transit development program. We had a discussion at Stack about that, so I won't uh, repeat that information. Uh, we had an update on congestion mitigation and air quality uh, by America waivers. This is um, a series of waivers that have been pending for quite a long time, really uh, nearly two years now. Number of uh, funded projects, mostly alternative fuel vehicle purchases that have been held up for lack of a waiver from the Federal Highway Administration and the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, a number of those. Uh, were included in a recent waiver, um, including the purchase of a uh, rack-funded street sweeper for Wheat Ridge. Uh, however, there remain about $7 million worth of CMAQ-funded uh, vehicle purchases in Colorado that still have not received their Buy America waivers. Uh, so continuing, uh, CDOT is continuing to work with um, uh, Congress and with the US, USDOT to secure those waivers so those purchases can move forward. Finally, there were a series of uh, mobility topic presentations uh, from CDOT on mobility choice, which you've talked about several times and had presentations on. Um, um, on the smart mobility and technology infrastructure, uh, Director Pfeiffer in his role uh, at CDOT talked about uh, some of CDOT's efforts around fiber optic uh, system deployment and expansion around the state as part of their uh, smart mobility initiatives. And then uh, there was a presentation and a discussion on CDOT's partnership with a number of uh, private entities that are exploring the possibility of Hyperloop and Hyperloop-like technologies um, around the state, primarily in the front range. Uh, to begin with, um, and uh, I think that was that was the major components. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, thank you. Next up, report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, Director Rakowski, please. We have not had a meeting since the last Dr. Cog meeting, but we'll have one shortly. Thank you. That was quick. Report from the Metro Area County Commissioners. 
Any commissioner wants to jump on? Okay. Director Hayden. I was elected. Everybody was like, were you the one that came? Thank God. <laughs> one want... of us went. <laughs> pretty, okay, maybe not that dramatic, but, you know, it was pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> and at first I was like, because I never go. I was like, no, I didn't, didn't go. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I did, because we hosted. <laughs> So Adams County hosted. Um, we had everybody over into our new human service building. Uh, we talked about our marijuana regulations that have been in effect now for four years and how well it was going. Um, it was pretty active. I was really impressed by the questions that we received and the amount of information that was exchanged among the, the counties. So that's what the meeting was about. Thank you. And I have to make a comment. Your human services building is just gorgeous and great. And Gives a lot of dignity to the folks that go there. So thank you. Good job. Um, report of the, uh, oh on the advisory committee of an aging. So I'm sure that is Jayla is coming up here. Hello. I was skipping there. Talked about um, the closures of assisted living facilities in the region. Um, actually, we just have three more announced closing uh, uh, yesterday. Um, all Medicaid facilities and kind of what that does to the capacity in the region. And then I took my aging advisory committee over to the new building and showed them there's a lot of apprehension about going there. My oldest advisory committee member is 89, um, and I have uh, six uh, over 85. So there's a lot of apprehension about going downtown. They swear the lanes are smaller down there. Um, than they are anywhere else, uh, and you know the buses and the and the uh, I don't know why they put those big trash bins out in the middle of the street or on the side streets, so that the buses have to pull even more into your lane. Uh, but uh, you know we showed them where they're going to park. We showed them how to to get into the building. We showed them how to use if. Some of them have had, you know, knee replacements and hip replacements, and uh, so if you have, you're in one of those situations, how to use the elevator, and uh, they were excited. They were excited about our fancy new building, and uh, a couple of them said, oh, I think we need to get dressed up, a little more dressed up uh, <laughs> when we come down here. So it was fun. Uh, we did have a, a few challenges, like I got in to start the cog car, and uh, it wouldn't start. And then Roxy uh, was calling for the van, and the van wasn't here. Um, and so, uh, and then one of my people, uh, who was a younger person, uh, thank goodness, not an older person, decided that they were just going to walk back to their office because they had a kind of an emergency, and I lost her. I couldn't find her, so I had to go looking for her, and then finally tracked her down. And she's like, oh, I'm back at my office. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. <laughs> so it was an adventure, but we made it through, and I think they're excited. Thank you, Jayla. Uh, reports from the rack. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, let me see here. So um, the rack is is still actively recruiting the replacement of Ken Lloyd, who's retiring after boy, I, I can't remember how many years. I know it's a long time. I know it's the only executive director they've ever had. How many is it, at least? Twenty-eight years as executive director. So um, I know he's planning on retiring later on this year, and so they're actively recruiting. There was uh, two. Uh, agenda items of any significance. The first was we had a presentation on, uh, on RAC's uh, air quality public education campaign, Simple Steps, Better Air. Um, so that, that was, I think that was well received by the group. Um, we also had a presentation by uh, Gary Kaufman, who's the director of the um, Air Pollution Control Division on EPA's midterm evaluation of light duty vehicle greenhouse gas standards and California advanced car standards. Um, that was an interesting discussion. I learned an awful lot from it. Um, Elise, you can chime in here because you know more about it than I do. But we did had a conversation about um, some of California's emission standards, um, the zero emitting vehicle, or ZEV, and the low emitting vehicle, LEV, um, and its applicability to uh, Colorado in the future. So we had a good discussion about that as well. And uh, that is it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Reports from E-470 Authority, uh, Director Rakowski. We had a the auditor's report, and there are no, no negative findings, a clean report. I have brought a copy of it. If anyone would like to borrow it or keep it, I can arrange for extras. And I want to commend uh, Director Dyack for his uh, new role at E-470, and he's been a great contributor already. 
Thank you, Director Rakowski. A report on Fast Track, Mr. Van Meter. I only have 12 pages to uh, work off of. Um, right. no, actually, <laughs> since my boss gave a pretty comprehensive uh, presentation on the same topic earlier, and there's more information in our board package. If there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them, but I have nothing further to add. All right, thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Um, wow, look at what time it is, 55 minutes early. So, so real quick, next meeting is not on uh, June 20th, but the 27th. Uh, one clarity, I think we're going to wait for staff to clarify on the workshop on June 7th on the work session a work session I guess. yeah we're, we're pretty darn close to canceling but we we wanted to reserve in the event i'm looking but, at ron but i did <laughs> ask that if they cancel it to do it early because school's out a lot of vacation start we want to know right away all right we're going to cancel it all right it's canceled i tried earlier but i was told no <laughs> um so that that's it um other matters by members any other matters if not, thank you. It was a pleasure serving as your chair tonight. Take care. 55 minutes early, you can remind our chair that we are fast. Thank you.